Hi, I'm Brett Zuliano, creator and writer of the Dust Bunny Mafia and the Detective Potatoes comics. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using the handle Dust Bunny Mafia. I'm also active on Kickstarter and my website, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. It's been two years since he's been back on the show. I learned so much about the mafia. Of course, I'm talking about the ever-talented Brett Giuliano, the creator of Dust Bunny Mafias and the brand new Detective Potatoes. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Two years is a long time. A lot has changed, I'm sure. <laughs> it has. I ran uh, downstairs right before this to kind of, you know, look at the stuff that I've produced. You know, I was like, I know that, I mean, when I was first talking to you, I thought we were talking back in 2020. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, so two years. So I've done a couple since then, but not as many as I had. But yeah, so I uh, have had a lot of uh, new projects since then. Um, yeah. I don't remember the last one. We were probably talking about volume one, new cover, volume two, yep. based on a true story, volume two. And then I put out volumes three and four, volume mm -hmm. four last year, and then came out with new books sometime in 2020. The second edition of the Dust Bunny Mafia comic collection called The Blind Tiger came out right as COVID hit <laughs> in May. I funded that one on Kickstarter. And then last year in October, the third volume, It's Business Not Personal, successfully funded uh, last year. And I fulfilled it in December. Then I ended up, and there's, you know, some things in between. This one you would find interesting. I created a little pinup thing of mob mules. <laughs> so real life mobsters with animal nicknames. Nice. And I turned them into their animal personas. <laughs> and so... uh I scoured the globe trying to find uh, interesting animal mobsters. And yeah, so yeah, been a little busy. We're jumping ahead a little bit here, but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, though, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am Brett Giuliano. I'm the creator of the Dust Bunny Mafia, which is a newspaper style comic that's like Looney Tunes meets The Godfather. I also, as I was just showing i've had a lot of projects i like to combine real life mobster uh trivia and fact and fiction um with my cuddly cartoon mobsters and try and give some people you know some history that they might not know about and that was the one thing and i was hinting at that at the intro here is there's a there was a long running uh, a long standing rum running here in in Windsor Ontario uh, to the to the point that there was a secret room and they use it for tours now there was a secret room where Al Capone visited Hiram Walkers which is a local uh, distillery in, in the area here mainly for whiskey and and scotch and things like that but it got to the point where they found more tunnels in the city when they were demolishing restaurants that were like old historical sites and they found long running tunnels that ran to Hiram walkers uh, throughout the entire city. And so most of them have been decommissioned and closed down, but it's just amazing the history of the mob and, and how far reaches their fingers were. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're talking about, of course, your brand new book, and this is a, a prose book. Uh, you're now an author, not just a comic writer and creator. So you're now an author as well, too. You're getting that. I have to extend your title now. Um, <laughs> Tell us about Detective Potatoes here and, and how did that come about? So Detective Potatoes is a uh, spin-off book um, and it's a mixed prose and illustration book that I actually co-authored with a good friend of mine, Daniel Bernstrom, um, who's a children's book author and was actually my college roommate. And Detective Potatoes is a all ages noir style um, detective novel that, as you can see, mixes prose with illustrations, and it's set in my Dust Bunny Mafia universe and features my pigeon detective, uh, Mickey Potatoes, as he, in this book, um, tries to solve the case of the coffee apocalypse, where all caffeinated coffee has disappeared, and he has a inkling that the mob has something to do with it. 
it is a sad day if coffee ever disappears from this world. I will I will not be happy. Yeah, all the people start uh, going into zombie mode when the coffee disappears. It looks like a fun book there. Why did you want to write this story and why was it important to get it out there to the masses? So this book was actually, well, it was a collaboration from the start. Um, so my friend Dan, we have been friends for over 10 years. I hate to say that because the gap keeps you know, going. He's been bugging me ever since I came up with the idea for the Dust Bunny Mafia. He was like, I love you and hate you as a writer for coming up with this idea because it's brilliant. And his kids have loved my comics. And he's like, I want to play in your world. And I'm like, okay. And so we were talking about it. And this was a really collaborative event. So when he was telling me about, he's like, I want to write a book in your world. I want you to illustrate it but we're going to do everything together. He had the idea for it. And then we had huge brainstorming sessions, a couple of hours, you know, every couple of weeks and where he, every step through the process was like, here's what I want to do. And the goal with this book was to kind of give kids, the kids that like my comics or like the style of my comics, a gap and kind of bridge the gap between just comics and into full-fledged reading. And so it was um, kind of the reluctant readers is the age that it was targeted towards kind of the eight to 10 in which the kids are trying to get them off of just reading comics and into actual full prose novels and stuff like that. And so thinking about books like Captain Underpants and Dog Man and things like that, there's a need for it, especially a need for boys to get into real books and stuff. And so Dan saw it with his kids, He how they picked up some of my books more than they picked up some of his books when they would go on vacations and stuff. They're like fighting over my comics. And he's like, I want to do this. And I'm like, I trust you. Let's do this. And yeah, that's kind of what how it all started. Yeah, I'm not going to say it's jealousy, but it sounds like, you know, he just wanted to make sure that, hey, look, you're reading my book as well, you know, like trying to get his kids towards, now that you've read my book with, with Brett, you know, let read some more of my books, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the joy of, of parents to see their kids reading and to get them into, you know, see their, their creative minds start to form and start to, you know, journey towards the wide world that are currently available with books today. And now I'm glad that you're, you're creating Detective Potatoes. What was the creative process like back and forth? Was it was it a fairly easy process because you've already, you know each other? Was it very, a very familiar process in that regard? Or did you pick up any tips and tricks from his, uh, his creative process that maybe you're going to implement in your own style? Yeah, it was very easy since we've known each other for a long time. And back before COVID happened, I actually flew up to... Uh, Minnesota to attend a Comic-Con and that's where he was living at the time. And I was able to stay with him for even just a day, um, him and his family. I was able to ship a box of books up to him. And so like, we've always had, he was one of my best college roommates. I wish that could have lived with him longer. This creative process, it was just this ongoing dialogue. We did everything through uh, Google Docs and Google Drive and everything like that. And so we would have you know, big, long phone conversations, talking about the book and talking about different plot points. And then he would share drafts with me and then I would uh, review them and kind of be like, all right, I like where you're going here. This doesn't make sense with this character specifically and things like that. I mean, he's familiar with my comics, but there's a difference with creator first an avid fan. And so there were some times where it was like, um, you use the nickname and the guy, these are like in the string of all these dust bunnies were around. And I'm like, that's, these two are the same. So you need to merge that, you know, like here, you can flip this in and, and I don't expect him to know everything about it. That worked really well with just the advent of, you know, Google drive and the like Dropbox type um, sharing capabilities. So I could share him like my illustrations. And I would say like, all right, here's where this is. I think in the story, and I would like storyboard it and I would kind of send him screenshots of his script printed out and kind of, I think here's a little thumbnail and this is where I think this should go. But then he would take his own, you know, direction on where he thought um, different things would go. And so, and yeah, it was just nice being able to 
work with someone who was a friend, but was also accomplished in his own right. And so he has had a deal with the publisher. He has an agent. He knows how to hit deadlines. This was just a personal project, but we could at least say, all right, we want the book done by X because we're going to kickstart it. And we're going to, he also wanted to pitch it to his agent. And so it's like, we had everything lined up that it was like, we pitched it to his agent. It didn't get rejected. It's still on the agent's desk. There's still a possibility, but we didn't hear back. So, okay, we're going to go to Kickstarter and we're going to just see if the people want it and between his audience and mine. So at least the first book. That's wonderful. See, it's great that you're getting multiple eyes on it here. And, and if it gets picked up by a publisher, that's even better. That's amazing to see. Well, back when I had tried to schedule it was when the Kickstarter was running. And so um, the Kickstarter ran mid-February um, to mid-March and we overfunded. We got about 125% of our funding goal. Yeah, we aimed for 4,000, came just under five grand in US dollars for it. Um, so we're going to be printing about 300 copies of the book, as well as um, we've got a handful of um, some fun merchandise, including um, some of these detective potato crochet uh, figures. I also have a plush coming of his partner, who is a uh, squirrel um, that's going to be kind of like this guy except a squirrel version of a plush. So those are some of the uh, extras, extra goodies that the Kickstarter helped us uh, secure. I'm going through the proof right now. Okay. Uh, so what I'm showing up is the proof version. Both Dan and I have looked through it. There's only a couple things. Um, for the most part, this book is done. Um, back cover, front cover, everything is exactly what we want and we're pretty happy with it. There's a couple of inside tweaks, um, but for the most part, this book is done. I'm waiting for one revision um, from him and then we'll re-upload it and I'll send him, we'll do another round of proofs. And then assuming everything's good, we should be shipping it in June or July. Perfect summer reading by the beach. <laughs> yep. And I uh, have on my website pre-order up and they'll ship with the same time as the Kickstarters. I, I love seeing that success when it comes to comic creations and campaigns and everything like that, because you've done su such amazing work in your other series as well, too, and in the various books that you've come across. But you've been a very big proponent of education and and everything like that. So I love seeing that you're you're taking a next step and maybe a new direction for future books as well, too. I think that would be amazing to see. Thank you. Looking at the educational factor, and you're a very well-read person. I know we talked about this during our last interview. What other books have you picked up recently that you may think would be interesting to other people? Oh, I've got too many. <laughs> um, I had, sadly don't have any of my books next to me. I wasn't expected for that one. wasn't prepared. I mean, as we've talked before, I'm a big uh, proponent of the true crime um, community. I just finished reading a, a book on um, LA in the 1920s and 30s. So the book is called The Los Angeles Sugar Ring, Inside the World of Old Money, Bootleggers, and Gambling Bairds by uh, Dr. J. Michael Neota. And it basically is talking about, I mean, it's some of his family history. He's the great grandson of both the LA mob boss, Jack Dragna, and also one of his other grandfathers was a one of the big bootleggers in Southern California in the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s. And so this book talks about, it's, I mean, it's his family history, but it's super well researched. And it talks about like basically the 1900s of LA and how there was a big organized crime. I mean, as many cities had um, big organized crime influence I've gotten to know the author through online and through some of these Facebook groups uh, for the organized crime. And I've, he's a friend of mine, and I've just started now digging into his uh, true crime library. He's got four books published, and I've uh, had this on my to-read pile for probably three or four years. And it was a fascinating history um, of L.A. and the uh, kind of criminal underworld of L.A., 
not something despite living in LA for 10 years that I really had much uh, awareness to. Um, but yeah, so that was a book I really enjoyed that I just finished last night and started a new one. The new one is called The Cigar, and it's a um, New York mobster who was known as Carmine the Cigar Galante, and he was a big um, mafia boss um, during his height was the 60s and 70s, a little bit into the 80s, um, and he was one of the bosses of the five families of New York, of the Banana family, and he was actually known for um, his role in the um, the French Connection, oh, which, uh, yeah, so the uh, heroin importing um, from Italy into um, Canada, the, fr- the pipeline, and then in getting into New York in the 60s and 70s, I believe. He was kind of the uh, brainchild or the mastermind behind it. Now, I'm going to make this a two-parter. Top five mafia that in your top five, who are the best mafia? What would be the top five cities you would live in during the mafia era? Oh, um, all right. Let's see. The uh, Let me tackle cities first. I think that'll be easier. To really experience uh, kind of the mafia during that, during their heights um, in each city, uh, New York and Chicago, uh, top two, I'd probably say, I mean, you got to go with Vegas is in there. Montreal, I would say. Um, There was a big mafia influence in Montreal. And then, I mean, probably LA to round it out. Um, Usually the big cities, but I mean, they, as I could show you, if I was downstairs in my basement where I've got my true crime library, I've got 50, 60 books. And it varies between, I've kind of got them broken up into region. So, I mean, I've got stories from, you know, Seattle and uh, little uh, Denver, Colorado, and places like that where you wouldn't expect there to be a mafia. But they had some decent ties in their heyday. For your other question, top five mobsters. um, I mean, everyone's most well-known Capone has to be one of my uh, top five most interesting. I mean, there's a reason why everyone knows him from his legendary days in Chicago to Alcatraz. He's up there. Actually, the uh, guy I just referenced, Carmine, the cigar, Galante, has always been fascinating to me. He's actually one of the first mobsters I had a uh, design commission for when I did started doing my based on a true story, um, I created a shirt for it that has uh, Galante cigars as like this fake cigar shop um, that I integrated with one of my first based on a true story collections um, for Kickstarter and had this nice tie in. Um, he has always fascinated me and there's been so little information um, talked about with him that until this book came out just this year, I've only picked up glimpses of fact and, you know, mostly fiction based on, you know, Wikipedia and different things. Um, But there's been so little talked about him, but he seemed like such a big connection um, to the five families of New York that he just fascinated me. So three, uh, Vincent, uh, the chin gigante, um, also a New York mobster. He was known as the odd father. He used to check himself into mental institutions, and it was a voluntary thing to try and duck uh, prosecution. So he basically was called the odd father because he would come out unshaven. Um, He basically lived within like this four block radius of um, this area in New York, and he had his social club. He had his uh, all his enterprises. He was big in the... uh, the garbage collecting industry in New York. Um, And he basically used to have this crazy routine where he would basically try and act like he was insane. And he would mumble to himself. He would talk to parking meters. He would come out wearing a bathrobe and would just like, you would think he's crazy. And that was his whole game. And it was revealed shortly before his death 
that it was all an act. I mean, people on the inside knew it, but to the world, he did this perfect projection of an insane, you know, and they wouldn't think that he was a, um, or they hoped he wouldn't be in, you know, actual, uh, be capable of what he was doing, what he was running. Let's see. Another uh, one I found interesting, uh, Bugsy Siegel, you know, uh, famous kind of L.A. Vegas mobster um, of the 1930s and 40s, glitz and glam, um, kind of known for he hung out with like um, the movie star and kind of was this uh, little New York tough guy um, that then came to L.A., had money and wanted to show off and kind of wanted to get into the movie industry, but then was this mobster at heart. Then he moved to Vegas and kind of was known for being the face behind the Flamingo Casino um, and kind of started or kind of they had stuff in Vegas at the time, but it was very, it wasn't the glitz and the glam that Vegas turned out to be. So he kind of had that vision and it's, kind of a little bit cliche, but I got to go with probably Lucky Luciano for rounding out the top five. I mean, if you gave me 10, I would start getting into, you know, but there's so many iconic mobsters. Yeah, that'd probably be my uh, top five. I had to limit you just because I knew you you would be able to rattle off probably 20 or 30 of your, your favorites and, and give reasons why. So we'll save the top 20 for your next book. Uh, when, <laughs> when you come on there, I'll, I'll ask you for your top 20 favorite mobsters. Is there anything I haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those who are listening and watching to this interview uh, before we wrap things up? I mean, um, I've kind of told you about it. I've kind of shown my array of products. I've got a lot of stuff in my online store. I've got... Um, pretty much everything up there that I showcased earlier. So, I mean, if you like uh, true crime, um, I've got things like my Mob of Moles uh, pinup booklet, volume one, um, that showcases real life mobsters with animal nicknames uh, reimagined as their animal counterparts. I've got, I've also got four of my based on a true story uh, mini comic collections where I take real life mobster stories and adapt them using my fun cast of cartoon mobsters. And then, yeah, I've also got three full comic book collections, uh, like your classic Garfield, Calvin and Hobbes style. I've got Meet the Family, uh, The Blind Tiger, my second collection, and It's Business Not Personal. Um, and they're all available for purchase in my online store. And where can we find you? How can we support you online that way? So my main website is dustbunnymafia.com. Um, I've got a link tree, um, link tree slash Brett Giuliano, um, where it has links to all my social media profiles, Dust Bunny Mafia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter still for now. Uh, we'll see if that changes. Um, and then, yeah. Um, on my online store or on my website, um, comics.dustbymafia.com, links to my online store and where you can find all my uh, merchandise products. Well, Brad, I do hate to say it, that that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you again for coming back on the show. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Well... <sighs> We've already heard from where you can find him. So if you're if you're not supporting Brett and his amazing comics and his work on his website, you're you're doing yourself a disservice because it's an amazing batch of creative talent that he has there, and I can't wait to see what he has in the future as well too. Like I said, though, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can of course find this interview and a thousand, well, more like twelve hundred plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com that's the word two not the number two the podcast is back on our website which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com search for two geeks talking though on itunes spotify any of your audio streaming services of course our youtube channel is way more updated than our podcast and our website because i'm only one person which is youtube.com forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out Thanks for listening and watching on to Geek Stalking.